Welcome back to Product Ask Me Anything to all of you that are joining us today. Uh, my name is Lee Garrison and I'm your host. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I've been an active part of the product management community for quite a number of years and uh, more recently working uh, in the startup world uh, as an advisor at Mars and, and some other uh, ventures. If this is your first uh, Product Ask Me Anything event with us, uh, since it is a relatively new thing, we just started it last week as a community event. Uh, Mark Silver and I uh, collaborated on it. Um, and the idea was to get something into all of our calendars that uh, we were, you know, we could have a structured sort of schedule to take a break, a coffee break in the afternoon uh, on an almost daily basis and, and to talk about stuff that we're passionate about and, you know, practicing our craft of product and making sure that we're all staying connected to the community in, in this difficult time. Uh, the format, for those of you that are new to it, is, is basically an hour. Um, we're going to spend the first 30 minutes uh, with uh, Jen and I talking together. Um, I'll ask the questions. And in, in the meantime, I uh, definitely want to encourage you all to ask your questions on the Twitter handle, um, uh, at Product AMA, or Ask Me Anything. And, uh, and then in the last half of the hour, we'll get to your questions and uh, obviously uh, go where that uh, uh, satisfies everyone's interest. Um, so I'm going to pick a few questions uh, for, for our guest speaker to answer right now. And our plan is that we, we will get to all of your questions. If we don't get them on, on this uh, session, uh, we'll try to answer them directly on Twitter. And so uh, um, that we'll also have a recording of today's uh, session on posted on YouTube. And you can see some of the ones from earlier in the week as well if you want to get caught up on some things. If you want to get in touch with us and you want to uh, give us some feedback or suggestions for future topics or speakers, um, please do it on the, on the Twitter handle, at Product AMA. So our topic today is product and growth marketing. Uh, joining us to help explain the topic is Jenna Kellner from Owner, uh, which is an RBC Ventures company. And uh, she's also the co-founder of Growth Toronto. So welcome, Jenna. Thanks. Um, before we get into what's happening at Owner, which I do want to talk about, let's go back a couple of years to, what, 2018 when you co-founded Growth Toronto. Can you tell us about how that started and, and what you're doing there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was speaking on a panel actually uh, related to growth marketing and a few of us were sort of just chatting after reminiscing and talking about how there wasn't a lot going on in Toronto around growth and that it was super, um, you know, people didn't understand what it was. Uh, there were a lot of different definitions, which is okay, actually, and I'll talk more about that. Um, and there wasn't a place for us to gather. There was, you know, tech TO, there was marketing TO, sales TO, but this bridge of growth that covers, you know, everything um, and does fit into all the pieces of a business, um, there wasn't a place for that or the professionals that were sort of leveling up on that side. You know, it's a new-ish term, but it's certainly not a new practice. Um, and it just, you know, I sometimes say that it's a cross between guerrilla marketing, demand gen, um, and an understanding of where growth fits in an organization. Now, that's a, a, not a scientific or textbook definition, but often it lives in all those places. And so we said, let's do something. Let's create a place for us to meet and talk to professionals and uh, have host panels and dinners and hopefully get a course off the ground in the next little bit. That's great. That's great. That's uh... Yeah, it's, it's kind of how we started the product community too, you know, back all those years ago. Uh, you know, we always say nobody goes to university for product management. Right. <laughs> so, so we needed a community to share and learn together, right, as, as stuff evolved. And, and now we're 20 years later and, you know, almost 2,000 product professionals in the GTA. So it's, uh, it's remarkable how, how community really makes a difference. For sure. Uh, and contribute. So, so let's go back to like that kind of concept of product and growth marketing. What, tell us more about that. I mean, people have heard terms like growth hacking and things like that, but what do you see as product and growth marketing? Yeah. So I think it depends and you'll hear this again for me over and over. It depends on the size of the company um, and where growth and marketing fit into the product. So um, 
you know, when you're releasing a product, when you're coming out with a new feature, how are you testing what you're doing? And that's not just traditional product. There is um, growth there. You obviously want to pull certain levers and test certain um, scenarios. And I, I find that it has a really strong connection between customer success or um, support and the product and marketing and how those three are working together. And that's really where, uh, to me, growth fits really nicely into product. So how are we yeah. accelerating um, the customer onboarding, retention, uh, you know, the AR, the R metrics? Um, how are we getting people, um, how are we improving the bottom line for the, for the business and finding opportunities where we can accelerate growth and then maybe making those things a full-time part of the business or uh, building them out. They're not just a test. Um, that's sort of where for me, where uh, growth, marketing, customer success and product all sit together. Yeah. Neat. That's great. And yeah, I see, you know, as, as product teams in particular, are understanding more about how important it is to align the different parts of the organization. This is this is really interesting because um, you know, we're thinking more about the business as a whole and what are yeah. the business objectives. Which, in most cases, the ultimate objective is revenue and growth, right? Exactly. Um, and so, like, why shouldn't that be a fundamental principle in in our product process too? Right. right? And the product manager is pretty busy with the roadmap. So often, you know, if the company's big enough there is a growth person dedicated or a marketing mm -hmm. team dedicated to growth around that product and not just traditional marketing on that product, um, but also how they can accelerate it, where they can find gaps, where is a customer um, getting stopped? And that's not mm -hmm. just the product marketer, that's often a, a growth hat that needs to be put on. Now, I'm not saying you need a separate person for that, but mm -hmm you know, the product marketer doesn't always think about all those things. They're, they're busy doing everything they need to do to um, create awareness for the product and all those things. So where is the person thinking about where are they stopping? How can we make it faster? Um, and so it's, to me, it's a mindset um, depending on the and it, Yeah. And it's, and it's about the whole customer experience too, yeah. right? I mean, we're not just looking at a product as a set of features, but it's that whole experience. And as we start to build customer success teams and, you know, exactly. focus more on onboarding and retention and things like that, then obviously these, these things come into play. Yeah. yeah, that's neat. That's neat. Well, I want to come back around to that in a minute um, and, and talk a little bit about what that, how that gets into the product process. But let's just step back a moment and talk about owner. Um, sure. So whose idea was it? What, what stage did RBC Ventures get involved? And, and can sure. you describe how your team sort of works with the product team? Yeah, so... Um, that last part will, will get us back to the, this conversation. Um, right. So RBC Ventures is an interesting model in that many of the ventures are all created in-house. So it wasn't just one person's idea. When ventures started uh, just over two years ago, um, there were on a list of identified, you know, simplifying it. There was a list of identified problems that mm. around four or five different functional themes, you know, health, business, um, consumer, auto, uh, and a lot of the product folks and just folks who were the, around at the beginning did a whole bunch of research around proving these problems. Um, mm -hmm. And owner was the solution that came out around one of these problems. How do we help small businesses um, navigate? Where do we want to insert ourselves and solve one of these problems? Because mm -hmm. small and new businesses run up against a lot of problems. If you're reading the news right now, you know that small businesses and medium businesses are the hardest hit. Um, probably a lot of people on the, on the uh, webinar now are are feeling that um, or know someone who is and you know the pain point of finding and getting and incorporating your business is not fun especially if you are a non-technical don't have access to lawyers don't have access to resources um, person so if you're starting a restaurant if you're starting a gym if you're a main street business even if you're starting an online store you shouldn't need um, to hire a lawyer and so we differentiate ourselves from, you know, we're not a complex incorporation tool. We are your, you know, your basic, you need a simple, quick, fast, cheap, easy incorporation or business registration. Um, and it's an awesome uh, experience for a customer. Whereas going on a government site, as you know, is not the most pleasant. It's really hard to comb through. If you, anyone's been trying to read any of the um, documents being released right now, that's what mm. it looks like to try and register your business. So, right, right. Yeah. yeah, no, I know from firsthand experience what, what's involved. And, uh, but uh, sort of, so is it sort of like a, you're providing a portal to the process of, of registering your business? 
Yeah. No, so we've, we've rebuilt the entire process from start to finish. Um, mm -hmm. And the difference is that we help you along the way. So the differentiating factor is the cu customer support, the plain language, um, the tips mm -hmm. along the way. Uh, so you go in, you enter, you say, okay, what you pick the product that you need. There's a million resources and support that you can go into and self-serve. We also have mm -hmm. online chat, phone support, um, and it's the tech version of registering your business or incorporating your business. Okay. Um, similar to what you would expect from any like really awesome Amazon, Google tech experience online for registering for anything versus nice. weeding through legalese and an overwhelming number of documents. Yeah, yeah. And it's an interesting market problem because, you know, we, I think, I'm not sure, but a, a lot of people don't understand how important that small to mid-sized business sector is in the economy. You know, that like yeah. I, I, the last stat I saw a couple of years ago, there's something like 27 million small to mid-sized businesses in the U.S. Um, and, yeah. you know, that's why most companies don't target them is because they're really hard to reach, right? Yeah. It's easier to identify <laughs> who the big enterprises are and go after them, right? But there is a, there's a huge market there because it's a common problem that lots and lots of people have. Yeah, yeah and it's been yeah. a fun marketing problem as well to reach the people. It's actually B2C marketing, I always say. Mm. It's like I'm, mm. I, I was marketing to a uh, consumer that's not yet a business. Perhaps they've run a business before, but I'm trying to reach that person before they're thinking about starting that business or right at that um, it, you know, conversion point or where that yeah. is. Yeah, interesting. So... Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you work with the product team. Maybe first tell us what your product team looks like yeah. um, in terms of structure, and then let's talk about how you work with them. For sure. So I'll give you a little history. So when we started, we were three or four people, right? We were, you know, uh, we had a contract dev team, not full time. We had a product manager, a business manager, and sort of I was, you know, marketing and everything else we all sort of did everything and similar to any startup externally that's how it started at ventures as well um, mm -hmm. and we grew as the as the business grew and so eventually we brought the entire dev team in-house and the designers in-house there are a bunch of shared services with rbc so that's um really helpful you can pull on more services as you need them um, but we work in lockstep so at the beginning when we launched it was me and the product leader you know putting out the first blogs that we needed to get content out there and collaborating on getting our social launch just as we were launching the business and and doing the very foundational things obviously as we matured very quickly um i'm on mat leave right now but when we left uh when i left we were about a team of 20 uh that was only a couple months ago and i'm, I'm still pretty close in touch with the team it's around that that same number um and, and we, we have weekly, multiple meetings weekly with the product team on the roadmap. And then we just sort of split up and say, okay, um, you know, we're going to talk about growth and marketing and, and the revenue side right now. And you're going to keep building your business, the product. Um, and mm -hmm. a couple of times a week we connect and we say, okay, are there any, anything changing? What has come up? What do we need each other's support on? Um, and, you know, we're a 20 person team. So we sit next to each other and that, that collaboration happens all day, every day. Uh, yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay. So, so you're, I, I think you're le leading a, a few areas of the business. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, like a, like a typical founder, you, you sort of are wearing lots of different hats yeah. all the time. Right. So you, you know, those lines between your responsibilities kind of blur at times, but yeah. talk to us about the, the differences between sales growth and marketing for a, a product driven company. For sure. So like I said, we matured into this. And so at the beginning, you know, the product leader was the customer success person until we reached a certain capacity, we didn't hire customer success. And, you know, I wasn't answering calls cause I didn't have the deep, deep product expertise that our clients needed from a technical, you know, what should I check off? Um, but certainly supporting early days. And then as we matured, the separation is, is separation only in, in terms of what you function. And I have a strong belief that everyone should be thinking about each other's part of the business. So the customer success person has an opportunity to upsell or bring someone on or make them happy. The marketing side should enable that. Um, and the product should also work together on that. So there, there is obviously very different. I mean, everyone knows the three different functions and what those specific like high level jobs are. Um, right. But we work very closely to make sure that there's that type triangulation that I was mentioning earlier. Yeah. Um, so, so how do you, so how do you stay aligned? I mean, one of the biggest challenges in any business, yeah. especially larger ones, but also in a smaller one, you know, as things are changing rapidly is to align 
those different functions around you know the common direction or objective how do you guys do that yeah great question so we certainly all run towards the same goal um, and that has been the driving force of everyone including our engineers everyone is responsible for the same number um, what are we what are we going to hit how many businesses are we going to register and then a secondary number um, how many are going to become RBC business clients um, mm. from that and so we have great incentives with all of our partners but obviously RBC owns owner and so mm. um, you can be with any bank um, you don't have to be an RBC client to use owner but that's our second that was you know our secondary metric early days is obviously we want you know it, it's a funnel um, and that's not a secret um, right. We want to create a better business and a better way for customers and help small businesses, um, but everyone towards the same goal. So it's not just around, you know, if they want to speed up the sprint, it's because the end goal, it's going to help us get to that number. If we want to add another story right. into a sprint or, you know, change something, everyone has to be aligned. Um, right. But it's, it's an ongoing challenge to get everyone on the same page and it requires quite a bit of communication. Um, and I'm sure they're experiencing different challenges now that we're not co-located. Um, right. certainly right. requires a lot more um, clear communication and over communication is what mm -hmm. what I'm guessing is happening with companies who are successful right now with the the forced remote because we were really um, you know face to face collaborative um, in lockstep with each other and I also think it's a relationship side so it really has nothing to do with product and marketing growth and it's everything to do with the people um, right. and the reason you know when I joined ventures I was helping four or five of the ventures launch and I mm -hmm. sort of stuck with the team and helped grow and scale with them because I we gelled and we really worked well together so there's nice. you can't really replace that yeah yeah no I know I've 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 been fortunate enough to be a part of a dream team occasionally and it's great yeah. fun it, it's it really is. it's good yeah <laughs> but I, I know I, I didn't really answer your question on the on the structure of the team um mm -hmm. which was sort of going to lend it to there so as we grew what did we add and how do we how do we collaborate there so we certainly added people that bridge to product and um, marketing more traditionally um mm -hmm. we added uh, a paid and demand gen person and we added um you know a partnerships person so once those functions were running that's when we had it added those team members so okay. we didn't add a partnerships team member until i had built the partnership sort of structure and funnel mm -hmm. and channel but the product had to also be the place for us to advance that so we took a little bit longer to get there because the first year we were waiting for us you know building the business making sure we had the business case proven out okay how are we going to scale through channel partners the product's not ready for that yet how do we make sure we time those things? So it's one thing right. if marketing can go and do all these things, great. If you're not in lockstep with when the product can release, you know, the site and the page and all these things, um, it, you know, that's one of the places where, where things intersect. Right, um, right. You know, contract so, content yeah. and all that. Yeah. So, so would you say that, you know, either as part of the product team or, or more broadly cross-functionally, since you're a relatively small organization, yeah. is, there, is there kind of a well-understood product process? For marketing or just in general? Mm, uh, starting with like the product management function, uh, like definitely. yeah, before, before your go-to-market stuff. Definitely, definitely. Um, and I'm not the, the product expert, so I won't, um, I won't speak to the specific process, but certainly um, they have a very button down process um, in terms of figuring out new features. We collaborate with the design and strategy team as well as marketing in terms of, you know, our user research. And, mm -hmm. you know, I would collaborate heavily with them on, you know, what questions are we asking? Where are we going? What's our customer team hearing that is going to lead the product team to say, okay, we need to add this feature. And can we get that validated then by the design and strategy team who actually help us um, you know, reach out to our customers, run our surveys, analyze it. They have, you know, anthropologists and folks that can come in and lean in um, mm -hmm. to support us on those things. So from a, a roadmap standpoint, certainly. Um, from a, you know, short-term roadmap of, you know, what's happening next sprint or the sprint after, certainly a process there. And that's a collaboration between, you know, the technical team, the product team, and, you know, hopefully they leave some for marketing. Um, but it was certainly a journey and I encourage all product managers to think about the marketing side early days and help the dev team get on board there because that's where there is some tension sometimes when um, you know you put those marketing things on the back burner you don't leave 
space for iterations. And so we can bring as many people to the door, but if we're not actually helping them through the door on the product side, uh, what's the point? So that right. was a big learning curve for the product team um, in general that I see when I'm working um, with product leaders, um, perhaps that are newer uh, to product management, where it doesn't matter how many people we bring in. If, if they can't, if they're getting stopped on the payment page or if there's issues converting or things like that, that's where the product marketing really has to be um, you know, fluid. And that's right. where the growth piece comes in because you can't run tests if your dev team can't make changes quickly. If you can't right. add a banner, if you can't test two pages and if you can't um, iterate on all those things, then what's the point? And then what's the point of doing all this, pro building this entire product if you're not getting all the right customers and it's a really lovely right. cycle when it works and right. frustrating when it breaks down. Yeah, yeah. And also it's become, it's become you know, as part of the lean process, very iterative as yeah. well, right? Yeah. And I think it used to be that, you know, we thought of product management and product marketing as, a, as this kind of linear flow from, you know, uh, market identification and segmentation and problem definition and then you yep. build something and then and then there's this whole sort of go to market piece of yep. it right um, but in reality it, you know now it's much more integrated and kind of iterative almost circular you know like like the product teams in discovery need that input and feedback and contribution from the growth the growth teams you know? yeah so so how do you do that? Like what's, you know, what's yeah. the, so like funny. just give us, maybe give us an example or something of, you For know, sure. how do you guys do that? A quick anecdote is that early days um, when Ventures was set up, traditional bank marketing is not at all like that. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I never, I don't aspire to be a bank marketer. So that was not why I was hired, but um, it's there, there's the product and say, here, go run a campaign. So it took us a long time to teach the RBC um, you know, leadership that marketing is generally really integrated at a tech company and a startup into the product roadmap and, and all those things. And um, it's a different type of marketer um, than a bank marketer for sure. Um, an example, you know, if a, a more linear example is, okay, we all know what the roadmap is. We're waiting for a certain feature to come out. Um, we have our plan ready to go and we're waiting for that to, to come into queue. And that's a little bit more traditional where that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, where I would say it's a bit more circular like we're talking about is when we're trying to do testing and understanding from more of a growth side of things. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we want to accelerate growth this quarter. We know Christmas is a quieter season for owner and January is actually a bigger season for us. So how do we test different banners? How do we make sure, you know, and we get into a room, all of us, the, the head of the product, maybe a dev who's really interested in it, um, who's shown mm -hmm. interest couple people from the marketing team who say, okay, here's, you know, we want to make sure we're um, testing A, B, and C. Do you have any, do you agree? Do you disagree? Let's mm -hmm. sort of figure out what the right things to test are. Um, we need to hit this number. Great. We all agree because that's, a, all, we all have the same metric. How are we going to do that? And so it's often a collaboration across the teams. Um, and then we would then go back and solve the problems that we come up with in that meeting. So, you know, okay. how do we do this? Is it, do we have the capacity to even do that? You know, will we have the budget to do that? And then come back together and say, okay, here's what we actually can do based on the feasibility and the constraints that, that are available. Great. That's yeah. great. Thank you for that. So, uh, for those of you on the call, uh, participating, uh, just a reminder that we are taking questions on the Twitter handle. So, um, please ask your your questions for Jenna, um, and we'll we'll get to them. Uh, at product AMA is the is the Twitter handle, and uh, love to see your questions, and we'll we'll get to them shortly. Um, so Jenna, let's let's talk about some of the partnerships that you guys have developed, and how that fits into uh, maybe the the product roadmap. So you you guys are working with Telus and Zero and Google yeah. and Staples. Uh, um, obviously, those are critical to the business. So how did these partnerships come about and, and you know, what kind of relationship do you have with them uh, that, that kind of contributes to your product roadmap, I guess, is, is the For question. Sure. Yeah. So they actually started as a product uh, play versus a marketing play. So it was mm -hmm. how can we enhance the product without building? How can we create more value for users um, that become owner customers? Um, leveraging those relationships and offers that they might want to give businesses who are just starting. Mm -hmm. And there, we only had a few on the platform at that time. And then about a year in, 
that's I mentioned, you know, we, we were made a big bet that channel partners were going to be how we would scale to the next level. Um, as opposed to just, you know, online, uh, reaching people. Um, and that's when we created both. So when, you know, we were negotiating, um, partnerships there, it was how can we add value, but also how can we become a channel co-relationship for them? Not always. It doesn't always make sense to do both sides to do a, you know, a multi-beneficial uh, partnership, but often those are both in my mind. So I would say from a product side, I was always thinking, how can we use, you know, how does, you know, if we're thinking GoDaddy, how could GoDaddy help owner clients, but how could mm. GoDaddy also help us drive more business? Um, that's right. a natural one. You know, everyone needs a domain when they're starting a business. Um, but at the beginning, it was just a few, how can we enhance the product offering? And then we grew from there to say, how can we um, leverage partnerships to drive business and then also enhance the value of our offering. Nice, nice. And and what what sort of format does that activity take? Like do you have a regular cadence of meetings with partners around that kind of thing or yeah. or what, yeah. what, how does that work? Absolutely. So depending on the partner, weekly or bi-weekly or monthly, uh, depending on how many activities we're doing, things like that, um, we certainly have regular cadence. Um, more if they're if it's bi-directional. If it's one directional and they just give us an offer, you know, there's an occasional check-in to let them know how the how the offer is performing. You know, if they want to share another offer with us, things like that. But if it's bi-directional, we're certainly working on co-marketing, on adding value on both sides, on testing different levers, and that's very much in lockstep with the product too, right? So the mm -hmm. product and marketing teams together have to say, okay, we want to enhance this product through this feature um, and add this to the suite. And we had dreams and still have dreams of of making. Um, owner part of a bigger suite of offerings that help people start up more wholesome, more fully, right? Hmm. Um, hmm. So it's okay, you sign up, here's everything you need to start, or here's a really good suite of options um, to get you going yeah. into this size business. Um, yeah. so certainly a collaboration between the two. I love it, I love it. Start your business in a box, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's great. Hey, we have a question from one of the participants. Alicia is asking, if I wanna run my first user feedback, what is the best advice you can give to start and how to collect this feedback? Is it face-to-face -face or email or survey? How do you guys do it? Great question. So we do all of those, all three of those options. It depends on the type of feedback. Um, I often find at the end, like the, in the end of your product flow, a great way to get quick feedback is that question at the email and the confirmation email. How did you enjoy this? Are you happy? It would depend on the type of service it is. Um, and ask them to review or give feedback right away. If you want feedback specifically, let's say on a mock-up, um, there's lots of online, uh, like userresearch.com, where you can put up different like logos or mock-ups or different things, and or usertesting.com, um, and get a lot of different feedback. Um, there are also a lot of professionals on contract or that you can hire and things like that to help you facilitate these, and there are research firms that will help recruit people in the demographic that you're trying to target. Um, mm -hmm. So there are multiple ways and and again if it's designs or if it's your logo or if it's a slogan or if it's a a roadmap there's like so many different for ways. sure for sure and, and, yeah and I, I don't want to dwell on sort of the current crisis but like obviously it's going to be a little tougher to get together with people face to face so what are you thinking right now in terms of adjustments yeah. that you might be making to to continue that interaction and feedback I think there's some really creative ways that you can work with sending people things and also work on d dual screens. I mean, it's obviously not a perfect scenario, but there are awesome digital tools that you can use. Um, if you really need to see someone and how they interact, could you send them a camera for a short term? Can you set up a testing site that has people coming in after it's been cleaned? Are there different options that you can think about? Um, mm -hmm. That would obviously lead to more, lend to more digital right now. Um, and how can you send people packages of, of things that they need to have um, and then also facilitate it with more advanced technology. Um, right, right, yeah. right. Interesting. Um, uh, another question here from uh, Rhythm. Um, how have you introduced new features to keep your users and customers more engaged, especially after they've used your service to incorporate their business? Do you have an ongoing relationship with them? What's what, what role does retention play for you? So right now, uh, their retention was not a big 
priority for owner. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Conversion to an RBC client was the second mm -hmm. priority. So how do mm -hmm. we how do we make sure the experience after they sign up with owner and get a business um, is seamless? So it's similar, but like a different type of retention. Um, so we actually did a lot of testing with that. So we have tested a, a thousand different ways to convert people. Everything from email to the screen that they land on, reformatting that screen a bunch of different times. Um, and it really actually landed off on an in-person thing. So the seamless experience that owner offers isn't the same experience that you get when you go into a branch. The online sign up for a business bank account in Canada still isn't entirely online. So we couldn't offer that online. Um, mm. Banks still do need that, you know, know your client um, verification. But we did actually stop gap that with a concierge, I will call it. I have mm. that person call people to, um, and, and we've been testing with the timing. So is there a certain cohort of people that, you know, convert better? Or if we call them earlier on, will they like more likely convert than others? Um, so it's not really engagement uh, per se or retention, but what kind of service can we offer to enhance it? Can we help them fill out the forms? Can we help them book an appointment with the branch? Is that a point of friction that's causing people not to go in? Do they just not know where a branch is or do they, you know, is, are they never going to do it? So we did a lot and are continuing to do a lot of cohort testing um, and manual calls. As unglamorous as that sounds, all of us make, made calls at the beginning until we uh, built the business case to hire somebody to make those calls. Um, mm -hmm. But the entire team and everyone like you know vps everybody were was making calls to see what clients would say um so right right and i and i would imagine that a lot of your focus is on what things contribute to a higher conversion to an rbc client right exactly um, and, yeah. and what scenario so do they have to be this type of business does it have to be this certain time um i actually uh, incorporated growth toronto using owner uh, and opened a bank account um, with RBC and, and went through the whole experience, which was a really great opportunity to see where mm -hmm. things break down. Um, and, and I mean, drastic, we drastically change every week as we release new product features. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. hard to know if the experience is still as, you know, consistent as it was, but um, mm -hmm. it's great to have people who start businesses who work on owner to go through that. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, it's the old eat your own dog food or exactly. drink your own champagne as Mark Benioff says. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Okay. You're going to become a serial entrepreneur starting lots of businesses. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I love it. Okay. So, so you mentioned earlier about, you know, those, those kind of tests. Um, how, can you give us an example of one of those and how that tests actually or the results of that test, I guess, actually get into the product. Yeah, so we can't do anything, or sorry, we, we now can do a lot more than we could mm -hmm. without the product team. At the beginning, um, there are a, lot, a bunch of constraints. Being an RBC venture, we can't onboard tech at the same speed as a tech company could. Um, mm -hmm. So these are, this is a specific case, but even then, um, there's dev capacity. Um, so there are tools even in unbalanced that you could let's say um, use banners and pop-ups and landing pages and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But we recently shifted to, uh, I think it was contentful. Um, so now that marketing team and the growth team has a lot more access to the content on the page um, and can change it. But until then, until we were mature enough to have a content management system, uh, mm -hmm. we had to rely very heavily on the dev and product team to make sure that the tests were um, feasible and that the changes that we wanted to make weren't going to take too much time and they did quite a bit so we couldn't run a lot of tests early on um, an example of that was with the business bank account conversion so mm -hmm. and we also had a logo have a logo product where it's a similar type of test so where do we place the um, the conversion is it an add-on mm -hmm. at the cart is it a reminder because there's a huge refund for clients if they open a business bank account um, mm -hmm. but a lot of people were missing it so we had to figure out where were they missing it or why were they ignoring it at certain points in the journey? And when is it the most applicable? So we were testing a whole bunch of things um, to see if conversion rates increased. Um, everything from, like I mentioned, the time of day we called to when in the journey and the cycle they got an email, um, how long after we called them. And that was a collaboration with the product team. Like there's no way we could have done that without customer success product and marketing at the table. And that, you know, because we all, are, are accountable for the same number there was never a question around who should be there and it, nice. it was aligned yeah yeah that's great that's really nice um so uh so you're 
like it's great that you're you've got a way for the you know the market the marketing team to uh, to adapt quickly and try different things out. Yeah. Some sounds like somewhat independent of development. What um, you know what happens when it, it it involves a more significant you know effort you know on the back end or something? Yeah. Like what, what how do you handle that? Yeah, for sure. So generally, um, you know, as we grew, more processes came into play. So earlier days, I would just, you know, ping the head of the product and say, hey, we want to do this. When would it fit in? But as we grew and, and became a little bit more for formal with our processes, um, there's a weekly meeting with product team and, and one of the marketing team members that would bring forward priorities and would say, okay, here's what's happening. Um, here's something that we're looking to test next quarter or next month or how we want to, why we want to test this or see if it's working. And they would then go scope out the size of that dev work or that effort from the product design um, and everyone uh, and come back and say, okay, here's the size of it approximately. You can never know for sure, obviously. And then here's where we think it could fit in. And then we would negotiate just like anybody else. And then as a leadership team, these things would bubble up to us to say, okay, um, all these three things are equally important. How are we prioritizing them against the business? Uh, mm -hmm. And then, and then go from there. Um, nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that's, um, you know, that's, a, I think, an interesting concept for a lot of product managers, especially in smaller companies where, you know, they, they may not uh, have as formal a, a kind of interaction or collaboration with cross-functional stakeholders. Right. But, but this, this notion of a, of a product kind of advisory committee or planning committee or whatever you want to call it um, with cross-functional uh, representation is great because that is actually one of the most effective ways I've seen uh, uh, the, the organization get alignment because those people are all representing their perspectives on the business objective and you have a quick opportunity to, to really you know resolve that so that's For great. Sure. And yeah. I always prioritize, like, I empower the team to make the, the decisions as well. So, you know, it shouldn't be, leader, like, it really should be the product owner and the marketing manager or demand gen person, whoever's bringing that, that problem or test that they want to bring. For some reason, it should, you know, it should, it should even out um, with them in their hands. The other thing I want to say is with content and product specific knowledge, that's also where there's a lot of collaboration. So between you know early days or anywhere along the along the journey if anyone was putting out content that was product specific i like 100 percent of product person needs to review it or someone who has product expertise so if we're putting together a document on you know the top 10 ways to save you know money through your taxes or this or that if it's product specific knowledge a product team member has to review the marketing content um because sure. without that we can probably accidentally put a something that's not true or the customer success person who also is deeply, deeply knowledgeable on the product. So someone right. has to edit it uh, to make sure. Right. Right. So I have another question here from uh, Mitch who says, how does budget freedom and size impact the quest for continuous optimization on a daily basis? Uh, you do have any examples to compare or contrast the, the owner approach with? Yeah. Budget freedom and size. So there's a lot of flexibility. I would say with most teams that I've had exposure to on the smaller tests, it's when the bigger tests impact, um, might impact a, a you know, end of quarter number or revenue goal or something like that, where we would need to get more stakeholders involved. Um, and something would take a little bit longer, but most companies I've worked at, even when that comes into play, you have to make sure the team has a good sense of urgency around getting these things approved. Um, and that you're, I mean, it's really about the leadership of the company. And when we have had to say, okay, we're gonna run a fire sale on this. We need product marketing, all these people. Do we have a budget yeah. approval? We would have like an analyst or, you know, whoever in finance or someone to like the product business leader run the numbers on the impact of the PL if this yeah. went well and if it went very terribly. And we'd quickly watch the numbers um, as a product and marketing team together and say, okay, are we continuing? Are we not? What's the impact? Um, but I would you, say it's speed. It doesn't yeah. really matter the size of the company. Okay. Okay. And and do you do you have a, sort of a a fixed percentage of effort in a sprint allocated to testing, or 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 is it more ad hoc? 
we got there. We didn't start with that at the beginning. Obviously, that's not the priority. It's not just testing at the beginning. You really just want to learn about what your customers are doing and gather all that intel. But as you grow, for sure, there should be a fixed amount that could be used, but I wouldn't force it. Um, I wouldn't put a test just for the sake of a test. I would make sure that there's like any anything, uh, make sure there's allocated space for growth, marketing, and that entire function, and then leave it up to the, the team to say, okay, here's our priorities this week. We want to right. test. Now, a bigger, a, lar a very, very large company might have a different answer. You know, how many things is Facebook testing at a time, and do they have a minimum across their platform for sure? Um, but that's not my background, so. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that, yeah, in a larger company that, you know, it's, it's become uh, pretty clear that uh, the velocity of experimentation and testing uh, those things for validation uh, is really kind of a secret sauce, right? It's almost, it's almost to the point where the end product you're building is not necessarily your competitive advantage. It's your yeah. ability to learn faster than anybody else, right? Yeah. And, and, so and think, adjust yeah, as you go, as opposed to putting this final product out and then testing things later. It's right. okay, I have to release small things as you go. So maybe I'm not even thinking, maybe we're, we're testing all the time, but I don't mm -hmm. think about it that way, right? We're releasing yeah. one bit at a time, but that's more product driven than it is marketing driven. Um, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. That's great. So, um, uh let's see another question here so so it, it, you know you approached owner as a as a sort of disruptive you know uh yeah. offering or product um so you where you're shifting the power from kind of government and law firms to small business owners um how are you guys kind of embracing that tension to to grow your venture owner yeah so we never wanted to replace lawyers. There's a huge place for lawyers in complex deals and businesses. What we did want to bring in um, is the power and freedom for small and new businesses that didn't need to pay $1,200 to $5,000 for a new business. Some people are gouging crazy. Like the average price is around $1,500 for a new incorporation. Um, and some people for just a simple business registration um, just want a little helping hand. So they're willing to pay, you know, between 30 to $50 for someone like owner um, to basically translate the legalese and help mm -hmm. them through and reassure them that they're signing up for the right thing. Lots of people do it themselves and good for them. And it's, you know, it's not rocket science, but it is overwhelming um, when you have 18 other things and you're starting a yoga studio and this certainly isn't your skill set. Um, and so that's the, that's the client we serve. And so it's a welcome tension that, um, progressive lawyers fully understand. And I would love to get to a place where lawyers and, um, can use owner for the clients that don't mm. need um, their like high levels, high touch service. We actually right. were expanding into the accounting area as well, where accountants often do this for their businesses. Um, it's a bit of a big product build to have them have a private login to be able to manage mm. the um, businesses for their clients. So that's a, a, a future roadmap goal um but it's a welcome tension that is interesting yeah i think you know in like just like in lots of environments you know professionals especially are looking for ways to offload the repetitive sort yeah. of low value things um that need to still get done but and so that they can actually spend time on higher value uh yeah. you know uh, work for for their clients potentially so yeah. so that's great okay cool cool um so let's see any other questions here just as a reminder to participants um we are taking questions for jenna if you have questions about product and growth marketing please uh use the twitter handle at product ama and uh we'll we'll get your questions uh, answered uh, as soon as we see them um i guess another question i had for you jenna is is that you've been you've been pretty involved in marketing for a number of years and when you look at the the sort of market mark tech landscape um, you talked about this a little bit before with some of the tools that you guys are using what it, what's your sort of go-to platform in, in your Martech stack oh man there are so many um, <laughs> there isn't one and uh, that's the annoying answer um, but you need to find the the suite that works for you so which automation or email tool are you going to use um, there are different ones that are useful for different circumstances and what um, I heard someone else say um, and really resonated for me it's the, it's the tools that your team will use 
Those are the, <laughs> the best stack for you. So right. you want to be able to understand the data. You want to be able to um, capture that data throughout the process. So whatever those tools are, whatever marketer you hire, demand gen person you hire, whatever they're comfortable with using is probably the tool you want to get on. Um, if they have to relearn, you know, if they have to learn Salesforce, Pardot versus Marketo versus HubSpot, like, you know, it's obviously easier to, to use one that they, one that they know and you want yeah. them to talk to each other. Right? right. So, um, there are a whole bunch of tools that, that make that happen. Um, so that you can create beautiful reports and understand your data. And, um, I'm not a data person. Like I'm not the, the wizard myself, but you always need a wizard on your yeah. team. Um, that's not a helpful answer. Unbounce is awesome. Like you need a million landing yeah. pages to be able to do uh, product testing. So any landing page tool that you're comfortable with that can easily integrate. Um, I'm a big proponent of many variations, especially with your ad sets and all that. Um, mm. And then the feature when it integrates and you can use pop-ups and uh, sale features and all that is awesome as well. So that's neat. Awesome. That's neat. Yeah. Are there any other tools that you guys are, that you're using that, that have had that were kind of a surprise and have had a significant impact for you yeah so this isn't product or marketing traditionally it but it's the partnerships tool that we're using it's called partner stack uh, oh yeah i know and, them yeah and sure. that's, you yeah. know we did a lot of research to find the right tool um and there are many of them but not a lot that are doing the enterprise partnership channel um, as successfully and it was quite a big integration so it was one of those product and marketing um, initiatives where we had to say okay when is this a priority and um, how are we going to bring in this data a lot of data concerns obviously we need to be very careful not to pass any client data but we want to make sure our partners that are selling reselling owner get the mm -hmm. customers data that they need right that that is afforded to them that the customer that they brought on um, and that we can pay them for their referral fee and all that um, and then the feedback from there and what content can we put out there and as that product develops um, it obviously helps us yeah yeah and that's cool and it's cool because they're local too right yes so <laughs> that's nice that's nice we actually we actually used uh, their facilities for a meeting a couple months ago and it was oh, nice. quite, it was really fun yeah. they're a great team so, yeah they, they are neat um that's cool um let's see if we have any other questions uh let's see alicia has another question oh this is more sort of you know step back a little and look on your career what sure. what is what has been your most successful product launch and, and what made it successful? I would say it's within owner for sure. Um, and it was, you know, once we it took us about eight, nine months to to release the full product that was okay, now we're ready to go full swing marketing. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we launched Ontario Business Sole Prop, and then we launched Ontario Business Incorporations, then Alberta, then BC, and then each of the iterations. And we didn't do full on marketing until we were ready to, to go. Um, the launch for the full, you know, okay, we're ready to go full force marketing, um, won Canadian Marketing Award, so that was really exciting for us. Hey, uh, applause. Yeah, <laughs> I'll brag a little. Um, yeah, for sure. And it was really, it was fun to do it on what the bank considers a very small budget, um, very resourcefully and creatively, and just sort of bringing a new product into the market was very exciting. So how do you launch something that doesn't exist? Um, yeah. You know, yeah. or it does exist, but not in the same capacity. It was very fun, um, and we got a lot of great, great feedback on that. That's that's fun. So, so what? How much visibility do you get to to the RBC teams? Like, I know there's a really big product team at RBC in the digital, you know, sort of products area. What, uh, like, do you work with them, or or do they see you guys as a, you know, really? cool you know innovative <laughs> part of their you know their their channel or how yeah, does that how so it certainly evolved at the beginning mm -hmm. we were probably seen more as like a threat and now mm -hmm. that it's two years in more than two years in um it's a much different vibe like we work very collaboratively but at the beginning who were these people what are they doing you know like mm -hmm. anything new in any big um massive organization um but it didn't take long for the leadership to help that grow uh, do we we work closely with them more from a you know who, what are you guys doing and and my counterpart was the business team right so how are you bringing business accounts to market what are you hearing can we share market research data right that's you know mm -hmm. we're under the same company umbrella but we there is a Chinese wall for data um, mm -hmm. you know we we don't pass data back and forth but 
um, we do understand like the same market. So when one of us does a market research study or if we commission a PR study, how can RBC mention owner um, when they're mm -hmm. talking about small business products? Uh, so mm -hmm. owner was included in the small business campaigns, um, you know, with testing different features and things like that and testing different taglines, so to speak. Um, you know, they have full control over that. We sort of get sign off on how they speak mm -hmm. about it. But mm -hmm. similar to when, you know, another brand's included, you only get so much opinion, so many, so many opinions, um, mm. and they're still marketing it like a bank. So, uh, yeah, it, it was but, interesting learning. Yeah, but still, it gives you access to a much broader reach, too, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Absolutely. So that's that's great. That's great. Wow. But um, businesses don't. Um, it's funny the business people don't walk into a branch to start a business generally. So we they were don't. not really. Okay. Not, not traditionally. Um, so we're more we're we're up funnel from from the bank. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, that's, which is, uh, right. I mean, when you go to start, I mean, typical, maybe you remember this when you first started, you know, your very first business, like a bank account was not the first thing you were thinking of. It's like, exactly. okay, how the hell, what name am I going to use? Right. Exactly. And, uh, you know, and is anybody else using it and that kind of stuff. So yeah. that's, in, that's interesting. Well, that's very, very prescient to sort of look upstream in the value chain and, and decide, okay, where, you know, where can we help people and solve problems? And, yeah. also influence them you know about their choices that's that's really neat really cool. fantastic um, thank you so much for participating i think it's really been enlightening and certainly opened up my eyes a little bit to the sort of the growth side of of the strategies um which yeah. is really which is really helpful please help us spread the word uh, about product uh, <coughs> ask me anything ama uh so don't forget the twitter handle at product ama uh, and please share any feedback or future topics you have with us uh, uh, through that, uh, you know, through that uh, message too. Um, so looking ahead uh, next week, um, we have a couple of things scheduled. In fact, I think next week we have one every day. Uh, so if you're really starting to go stir crazy uh, staying inside, we'll keep you entertained at three o'clock every day. Um, and uh, I, we've got uh, some really interesting speakers and topics. Um, I think Monday is uh, looking at, uh, or sorry, is that Monday? Yeah, Monday is looking at uh, understanding product managers like a product, which is, uh, we're going to talk to some folks from Intersect about their professional services business um, and how they're manage managing a team of 20 product managers uh, uh, with global clients. Um, we're also going to uh, talk to uh, a bunch of other product leaders about uh, building mobile app experiences for pro sports teams. Um, we're going to have uh, 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 Saeed Khan come on and talk about uh, managing in uncertain times and, and leveraging uh, you know, data and things like that to help make decisions. Um, we're going to talk to a uh, senior leader at Bell about strategies to manage remote product teams. Uh, and then, and then uh, we'll wrap up the week with uh, talking about personalizing your audience's content experience. So join us on Monday at 3 p.m. Uh, we're going to talk to Chris Hurst and Carrie Allard from Intersect. Uh, and please follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, there's a LinkedIn page as well, at Product AMA, uh, for the, link, the registration link to all coming, upcoming uh, sessions. Enjoy the day. Be safe. Be healthy. And uh, keep practicing your product craft. It's, uh, it's really important to our future. Thanks. Bye for now, everybody. Yeah. Bye, Jenna. Bye.